Callisto is a figure in Greek mythology. She was a nymph in the Garden of Artemis and had taken a vow of chastity. She was raped by Zeus and became pregnant with his child. One day, Zeus's wife, Hera, saw Callisto pregnant and became furious, and she punished her by turning her into a bear and banishing her from the garden. The story of our heroine Callisto is a myth, but it also reflects the reality of sexual assault in our society today. For many survivors, they are victims of powerful serial offenders and are victim blamed by society. My name is Anjana Rajan, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Callisto. We're a nonprofit that builds technology to combat sexual assault, support survivors, and advance justice. Our company is focused on two problems. One, how can we empower survivors to hold their perpetrators accountable? And two, how can we ensure that the institutions that are meant to protect survivors actually do so? Today I'm going to talk to you about how Callisto thinks about the problem of sexual assault and how we've built products that take the user's privacy and security into account using advanced cryptographic methods. 20% of women, 7% of men, and 24% of transgender students will be sexually assaulted in their college career. 90% of those assaults are committed by repeat offenders. In fact, on average, a repeat offender will commit six assaults before they graduate. However, less than 10% of survivors ever take the action to come forward, and those who do wait on average 11 months before taking action. Only 6% of assaults that are reported to the police result in a perpetrator spending a single day in jail, which means that 99% of them don't face any real serious consequences. This essentially means there is no real deterrent to sexual assault in the United States. A few years ago, we surveyed over 200 college sexual assault survivors, and we asked them why they didn't report. And their answers varied. Some of them said that they didn't think they'd be believed. Others felt that they didn't think that the university would take any meaningful action. And others felt that it wasn't worth it to relive their trauma. But then we asked them another question. We asked, what would you do if you knew you weren't the only one? And suddenly their answers changed. They suddenly said that they would come forward because they felt more likely to be believed and they felt an obligation to protect their community. We see this phenomenon of low reporting rates as a game theory problem, namely that there's a huge first mover disadvantage of coming forward with high consequences. But once that first person does come forward, it opens up the doors for all the other survivors to take action. And so we became very curious about this. How can we solve this game theory problem and build a system that actually allows nobody to be that first victim martyr? At Callisto, our work is built around a central thesis, which is if we can empower victims to take coordinated and informed action to protect their communities, we can prevent the majority of sexual violence in the United States from ever happening in the first place. A few years ago, we launched our first product called Callisto Campus. Students who use Callisto Campus can go to their school-specific Callisto site, learn about the reporting options, and then create a time-stamped encrypted record of their assault. And then they could do one of three things. They could either save it in Callisto and do nothing, they could send it directly to the Title IX office at the university to start an investigation, or they could enter into our matching escrow, which means that unless a second person names the same perpetrator, no one will see that data. We're now on 13 campuses and serve approximately 162,000 students. And in the last few years, we've seen some interesting results. We've seen that students who are used Callisto are six times more likely to report. They report three times faster, and most interestingly, we've actually detected several serial perpetrators who would have normally gone undetected. And that's because 15% of our users who are in the matching escrow are matched with another victim of the same offender. We also know that any gender can be a victim and any gender can be a perpetrator. 16% of our users are not women. At Callisto, we think it's incredibly important that any law, policy, or program that is designed to help survivors is inclusive of people of all genders and backgrounds. So for perhaps the first time, we're starting to understand the spread of sexual violence in a unique and data-driven way. In the summer of 2017, news broke that a prominent venture capitalist in Silicon Valley had sexually coerced several female founders. Then we heard about another VC who had sexually assaulted several female founders. And another. Then we learned there were serial offenders in the entertainment industry and the media industry, and pretty much every industry after that. We learned that victims weren't just women, but included men and people of other genders. We also saw that serial offenders could belong to any political ideology, even when they pretended to be allies. And perhaps worst of all, we saw what happens when institutions turn a blind eye and that don't protect victims and enable more abuse to happen. The Me Too movement, which started in 2006 by Tarana Burke, exploded in the fall of 2017. 
And this is not surprising because many people could see their own stories in these headlines. They started to share their stories publicly because it was the only way to hold their perpetrators accountable. And people started to ask the question, how can we shift power so that it takes days and not decades and the power of two survivors, not 20, to stop serial predators? And in an attempt to answer this question, there were a lot of wealth intention, but frankly dangerous solutions that popped up that ultimately put victims in more harm's way. In October of 2017, a crowdsourced Google spreadsheet called the Shitty Men in Media List was created that collected allegations of sexual violence of approximately 70 men in the media industry. And the intention behind this was to allow survivors to anonymously name their perpetrator and warn others if they were not the only victim. This, as you can imagine, did not go as planned. Within 12 hours, that, leak, that list got leaked. The creator of the list was doxxed. And one year later, one of the accused offenders created a lawsuit not only against the creator, but also threatened to reveal the identities of those who named, were named in the uh, document. There's an incredibly urgent question here, which is, how can we stop the spread of sexual violence while also protecting the privacy and civil liberties of both the victim and the accused? As you can imagine, in the fall of 2017, Callista was flooded with inquiries of how we could bring our product from the campus space and apply it to this problem at large. And as we thought about it, we, there, there were three main considerations we had to think about to see how we could bring it to the Me Too movement. So first, when you look outside of a campus setting and you look at industries like Hollywood or Silicon Valley, the victim and the perpetrator don't necessarily belong to the same institution. So authenticating a network and defining the bounds of the network becomes quite hard. Second, unlike a college campus, there isn't necessarily a central investigatory body that manages these claims. And even if there were, would you really trust them? And then finally, when you look at the, di the difference between a perpetrator's power and a victim's power in a professional setting, it is incredibly asymmetrical. So the fear of retaliation and the need for security and privacy becomes even more necessary. And so it became clear to us that if we wanted to expand, we would have to build a new platform and a new delivery model to do this. In November of 2018, we launched a new product and service that we call Callisto Expansion that aims to serve every victim of sexual violence and misconduct in the country, which is one platform that can detect serial offenders of sexual assault, sexual coercion, and ultimately childhood sexual abuse. And we're taking this step by step, but we're first starting in our own community, which is supporting fellow founders in the tech industry who've been assaulted or coerced by a venture capitalist. And here's why. A year ago, we participated in Y Combinator. And during our time, we conducted a survey of female founders and asked them if they had ever been sexually assaulted or coerced by a venture capitalist. 22% of female founders in YC said that they had been, but only 6% said that they had reported it. And the reasons for not reporting it included wanting to protect their company, fear of retaliation, and frankly, not clear of whether there was any place to go to. But the main reason that they did report was to protect others. We launched our new platform, Callisto Expansion, on November 15th to approximately 2,000 startup founders of all genders. From there, we'll continue to serve as many survivors as possible in the US. Here's how the model works. A user is invited to Callisto, and they create a time-stamped encrypted record that names their perpetrator using a series of unique identifiers, such as a social media URL, an email address, or a phone number. They enter that information to Callisto. Callisto holds that information in escrow so that nobody, not even Callisto, can see that information unless a second person names the same offender. If there is a match, each victim is connected with a Callisto legal options counselor, who is a lawyer who can protect these conversations under attorney-client privilege. The options counselor will talk to each victim and help them understand all of their options and help them pick a path towards justice that makes sense for them. And because, since we're detecting serial offenders, one of those options can include connecting both victims together to take coordinated action to pursue justice. We think about this model in two key frameworks. One is a legal framework. How do we protect this data from, in, from a legal perspective, but also from a cryptographic approach? So let's first talk about the legal framework. Survivors have many options, but those options are quite risky, and understanding what they are uh, is hard without an attorney. It's hard to find an attorney, it's hard to afford one, it's hard to trust one, and Callisto solves that problem by providing matched victims a free lawyer that's focused only on supporting them, and we call those lawyers Call Callisto Legal Options Counselors. Once there's a match, the Legal Options Counselor will decrypt the record and find out the person's contact information and preferred contact method, and set up an appointment to establish 
a client attorney relationship, and then they'll just listen. They'll understand the survivor's experience, they'll create a safe space to help them feel heard and understood, and then they'll help them understand all of their goals and their fears. And based on those goals, they'll help them understand what path makes sense for them, what those risks are, and what is the path forward to pursue them. If they choose a path, the legal options counselor is there to connect them and refer them to the next phase. And if they decide mutually that both victims want to meet each other and pursue action together, the legal options counselor will serve as a second escrow to make that, comp that connection confidential and safe. Now, why does this matter? In a world without Callisto, the main paths forward are, are twofold. You can either go to the police or go to HR. And frankly, those aren't easy options to navigate. Sometimes they're not applicable. Sometimes they're not easy to trust. They're very hard to navigate alone. But with Callisto expansion, now you have a wider array of options and you're no longer doing that by yourself. And those options can include getting a restraining order, filing a civil lawsuit, pursuing a path through social media or the press, confronting the perpetrator, and believing in restorative justice. And for the first time, you're now enabling survivors to define what outcomes of success looks for them rather than having to become martyrs in a broken system. Now let's talk about the cryptographic approach. But before we do, let's first understand what the user journey is. So when you're first invited to Callisto, you are basically getting a whitelisted email invite to activate your account, and you're first called an invited user. When you activate your account, we consider you an activated user. When you submit an entry into the system, you're now an escrowed user. When you're matched with another victim, you become a matched user. And finally, if you are assigned a legal options counselor and have begun the process of counseling, you're now an assigned user. So what this means is as the user progresses through the user journey, we need to understand what data is being revealed and how do we ensure that it's protected but still able to be shared with informed consent. Before we get started into the crypto part, I wanna first acknowledge some of our collaborators who've helped us think about this problem and threat model this to ensure that we can design something that protects the privacy of our users. And you can see more about our work in greater detail in our white paper. Um, but today I want to talk about a specific user flow, which is that escrowed user, because we use a combination, of, a combination of very interesting cryptographic techniques to protect their data. And some of those techniques include client-side encryption, Shamir secret sharing, oblivious pseudorandom functions, and federated key servers in order to protect their data. So I'll walk you all through an example of that right now. So let's say we have a user, Alice, who's experienced sexual misconduct against a perpetrator, Mallory. She wants to enter her information into Callisto to be able to get connected to an options counselor if there's a match. So Alice will input a series of unique perpetrator IDs such as a social media handle, an email, or a phone number, and, a, and that information will be stored into a vector that we call P. We use an oblivious pseudorandom function over an elliptic curve federated across two key servers to randomize that vector P and turn that into a vector that we'll call P hat. From p hat, we can run a deterministic key derivation function that returns three values. First is a value that we'll call pi, which will serve as a uh, matching index. Second is a value a, which we'll use as a slope of a line. And finally, a, a value k that will serve as a key. Using client-side encryption, we doubly encrypt the record using k and the public key of the options counselor. Using the formula of a line with the derived values a and k, we can create a secret share, used, which we define as s equals au plus k where A is a slope of the line, K is a key, and we, that key ends up being the y-intercept of that line. And we take that hash coordinate of the user ID and the secret share, and we send it over to the Callisto database. <clears throat> now, even though Alice has entered her record into the system, we can't decrypt it without a match, and this is because we can't derive the key K located at the y-intercept without another point on the line. Now, let's say we have a second user named Bob, and Bob also has the same perpetrator, Mallory, and he enters in the same unique identifiers into the vector P. That will turn P hat into the same value, which will then return the same values from A, K, and Pi. But because he's his own user, his secret share will be different because his hashed user ID will be unique. At this point, he will also send that information to the Callisto database. Now, Callisto can't see the identity of Alice, Bob, or the perpetrator, Mallory, but what they can infer is that both Alice and Bob share the same Pi value, which means that they must belong to the same line. At this point, the options counselor is prompted to enter in their secret key through their dashboard, and they can then prompt the command to run the interpolation of the y-intercept, which will then receive the key k. So at this point, the options counselors are now seeing Alice and Bob's identity in the clear for the first time, but because they're attorneys, they've established attorney-client privilege so that their conversations moving forward are protected. Now what happens if a third person submits a record with a different perpetrator? So let's say we have a user, Carlos, who submits a record with the perpetrator, Sybil you'll see that the pi, a, and k values are actually different. 
connecting Carlos's point to either Bob or Alice's won't interpolate the correct y-intercept, which means he won't have the key to unlock Carlos's record. This means Carlos's identity is safe and mathematically protected. And this means that no victim will have to fear the risk of coming forward without knowing that somebody else has their back. This is just a tiny piece of how we protect our users' right to privacy. There's a lot more um, in our privacy scheme and our legal scheme, and you can read more about it on our white paper, but you can also go to cryptography.projectcalisto.org to see an open source demo we built that shows how this model works. We've seen how the dialogue completely changes when there's more than one accuser of a given offender. The most effective way to stop sexual assault and harassment is to prevent perpetrators from reoffending. And the only way to do that is to give survivors a safe and empowering way to report. This topic has dominated the news cycle for the last year and a half. And like many social justice issues, it has been polarizing and controversial. But this topic must transcend politics because this is a pervasive human rights crisis that affects us all. At Callisto, we are a team of engineers, designers, lawyers, activists, and researchers, and we are a team of survivors for survivors. In fact, many of us are building the product that we wish we had when we had to report. But I am optimistic because change is happening, and our security community can play a key role in this conversation, because we can build and design solutions that help people speak truth to power in a safe and just way. We believe in a world where sexual assault is rare and survivors are supported. Come build that world with us. Thank you.